For the deadliest and most wanted drug cartels, the competition, rivals, and bloody battles are all routine activities, but some take deadly to new levels. Stay tuned as I uncover the most deadly rivals that dared to stand in the way of the infamous Sinaloa cartel, owned by none other than the notorious Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. You'll know him better as El Chapo, the Beltran Leva cartel. Born in the infamous state of Sinaloa, Arturo Beltran, Leva seemed like he was destined to be entangled in a world of crime. Arturo grew up in the heartland of Mexico, surrounded by the shadowy figures of the drug trade, and as the oldest of five brothers, he naturally assumed the role of a leader in his family's drug smuggling gang, marking the beginning of his ascent into the dark underbelly of the drug trade. For years, Arturo remained a secondary character in the cutthroat world of drug trafficking, answering to more powerful and notorious kingpins. He played the loyal companion to the likes of Miguel Angel Fe Felix Gallardo, the legendary godfather of the Guadalajara cartel, and Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the formidable head of the Juarez cartel. But his true moment of reckoning came when he crossed paths with the infamous El Chapo. Aligned with the Sinaloa cartel, Beltran Leva played a significant role in establishing the organization's dominance. However, a bitter betrayal would soon rupture their once solid alliance. Believing that El Chapo had orchestrated the arrest of his brother, Beltran Leva sought revenge and escalated tensions between the two factions. This marked the birth of a bloody rivalry, as Beltran Leva joined forces with his family and loyal allies in a series of brutal drug turf wars against the Sinaloa cartel. And who suffered for it? That's right, the citizens. You see, the Beltran Leva cartel was no pushover. As the leader of the newly formed Beltran Leva cartel, Beltran Leva plunged Mexico into an era of unparalleled violence. The cartel quickly gained notoriety as they trafficked drugs like cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. Their ruthless tactics included kidnapping, torturing, and mercy mercilessly murdering enemies and anyone connected to rival groups. Beltran Leva's thirst for power and bloodshed earned him a fearsome reputation, propelling him to become the third most wanted man in Mexico. But as history has taught us, every reign of terror meets its end. In a meticulously planned operation, Mexican special forces closed in on Beltran Leva's hideout. On that fateful day in December 2009, the once mighty kingpin was met with a hail of bullets. Engulfed in a four-hour shootout, Beltran Leva's life was snuffed out, leaving behind a legacy of brutality and chaos. The demise of Arturo Beltran Leva was celebrated as a triumph for the Mexican government's war on drugs. However, the battle against drug cartels continues to rage on. While some remnants of the Beltran Leva cartel attempted to restore its former glory, their efforts proved futile. The loss of their leader triggered the downfall of the organization. The Beltran Leva cartel experienced a significant decline in power and influence. Internal divisions and relentless pressure from law enforcement agencies weakened the organization, resulting in a fragmented structure and diminished operational capacity. Though remnants of the Beltran Leva cartel may still pose a threat, their overall influence has significantly waned. The Barrio Azteca Barrio Azteca is a notorious street and prison gang with roots in both the United States and Mexico. The gang first emerged in El Paso, Texas, and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, back in the early 1980s. Interestingly, it all started inside the Caulfield Unit, a prison near Tennessee Colony, Texas. A prisoner named Jose Raulio Rivera from El Paso played a pivotal role in its formation. What began as a small group soon grew into a transnational criminal organization that thrived on illegal activities along the U.S.-Mexico border. Today, Barrio Azteca is considered considered one of the most violent gangs in the United States, boasting over 3,000 members spread across the country. They have a presence in various states like New Mexico, Texas, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. In Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, their stronghold, their numbers are estimated to be around 5,000 members strong. The reputation of Barrio Azteca is built on its image as a tough and fiercely loyal gang. They have a no-holds-barred approach, even resorting to murdering innocent civilians to instill fear and maintain the loyalty and obedience of their members. Some undocumented Mexicans who are arrested in the United States end up in Texan prisons. And once they complete their sentences, they are deported back to their home country, where many of them quickly join the ranks of Barrio Azteca, engaging in various criminal activities. Drug trafficking has long been a source of income for the gang, with ties to the Juarez cartel. As Barrio Azteca grew in power, they forged a close alliance with the cartel, resulting in a mutually beneficial relationship. The gang began purchasing large quantities of cocaine directly from the cartel at discounted rates. In return, they would facilitate straw purchases of weapons from Texan gun shops and smuggle them across the border. So, back in 2008, when the Sinaloa cartel thought they could take over Ciudad Juarez, the Barrio Azteca stepped up to protect their turf. They teamed up with La Linea, the armed wing of the Juarez cartel, to fend off the Sinaloa crew. You see, the Sinaloa folks wanted control of the drug smuggling routes in that area, but these guys weren't having any of that. It was more like, uh-uh, not on our turf, and together they gave the intruders a run for their money. These routes, known as the Juarez Plaza, are of 
immense importance to drug trafficking organizations as they serve as a major conduit for illegal substances into the United States. It's estimated that around 70% of the cocaine entering the United States passes through the Juarez Plaza. While the gang operates in both the US and Mexico, the majority of their violent activities occur south of the border. They've become a prime example of how Mexico's drug war transcends national boundaries. Members of Barrio Azteca can be either US or Mexican citizens, blurring the lines between the two countries. It's vital to point out that as of June 2020, the Los Salazar cell of the Sinaloa cartel was considered to be the only other organized crime organization on an equal level with La Linea when it came to the degree of control over the Ciudad Juarez criminal drug market. Barrio Azteca was not. The La Familia Michoacana deep in the heart of Michoacan. A power struggle between the Gulf organization and a group known as El Milenio formed, and from its ashes emerged an enigmatic force that would forever change the criminal landscape. La Familia Michoacana. La Familia had humble beginnings. Born out of the desperation and frustration of the people, they witnessed the rise of the Gulf organization, backed by their brutal enforcers, the Zetas, who sought to dominate Michoacan. But fueled by growing discontent and the surge in methamphetamine distribution, La Familia took a stand against the Zetas' control. In 2006, La Familia shattered the dominance of its rivals, pushing them out of Michoacan. They became bitter rivals in Mexican organized crime history, but amidst the chaos, alliances were formed. La Familia forged an unholy pact with the infamous Sinaloa organization. But because every cartel is in the game for its interests first, both allies fell out over Michoacan. They refused to allow the Sinaloa cartel to encroach over its territory, and it escalated into brutal confrontations, ambushes, assassinations, and threats leading to their falling out. La Familia's violence reached its zenith with a horrifying display of power where heads were callously thrown into a crowded club, Sol y Sombra. These brutal acts, alongside violent clashes with rival groups, caught the attention of President Felipe Calderón. He deployed federal forces to confront these criminal organizations head-on, but the cartel's mystique extended beyond their gruesome acts. Their leaders embraced a cultish ideology, blending Christian fundamentalism with their criminal pursuits. Under the guidance of Nazario Moreno González, known as El Chayo or El Mas Loco, religious volumes were written, and foot soldiers Soldiers were mandated to carry Bibles and engage in prayer sessions before their nefarious endeavors. Reports say that La Familia, along with other Mexican criminal organizations, supplied the United States with a staggering 200 tons of meth each year, worth $20 billion. La Familia alone accounted for half of this illicit supply, fueling addiction and ravaging communities across the U.S. In 2009, U.S. President Barack Obama designated La Familia as significant foreign narcotics traffickers. Their leaders were branded as kingpins, their assets frozen, and economic ties severed. However, La Familia's grip on Michoacan remained firm. Things took a dramatic turn when the leader of La Familia Michoacana was reported killed in a shootout with federal police. Yet, rumors persisted for years about his alleged demise until it was finally confirmed. Moreno's supposed death triggered a split within the group, leading to the rise of the next group in this video. The Knights Templars. In 2003, a man named Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, also known as El Mas Loco or El Chayo, returned to Michoacan with a mission. He sought to organize the La Familia Michoacana into a powerful drug cartel, with himself as the spiritual leader. The transformation was complete because he succeeded. La Familia Michoacana split to birth the notorious Knights Templar, which also became a notable opposition to the Sinaloa cartel. The Knights Templar, inspired by the historical medieval order, blended religious symbolism with ruthless tactics. Moreno and his partner, Vando Gomez Martinez believed they were doing God's work, protecting their people from the clutches of rival cartels. But their reign of terror didn't go unchallenged. El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel stood as a formidable rival. Over the years, clashes and rivalries between these two factions escalated, leaving a trail of violence and bloodshed in their wake. In 2010, Moreno's alleged death at the hands of Mexican authorities sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld, but doubts lingered. Some believed he had faked his death, continuing to lead the Knights Templar from the shadows. In 2014, the Mexican government, along with these self-defense groups, launched a joint operation to weaken the Knights Templar's grip. Several high-ranking members were arrested, and Nazario Moreno's death was finally confirmed. Yet, some still question the truth, wondering if he truly met his demise. As the dust settled, Mikoakan began to rebuild, but scars from the battles between the Knights Templar and the Sinaloa cartel still lingered. The legacy of violence and the struggle for control serve as a stark reminder of the dark chapter Mikoakan endured. However, in the aftermath, a new era emerged. The government intensified its efforts to dismantle drug cartels, bringing some semblance of peace to the region. With the Knights Templar weakened, other criminal organizations vied for power in Michoacan. New alliances formed and the Sinaloa cartel sought to expand its influence into the vacuum left by the Knights Templar. But do you think they succeeded? Where are they today? The Tijuana Cartel. 
The Tijuana Cartel, also known as the Arellano Felix Organization, or AFO, was a chilling testament to Mexico's drug underworld. They embody power, violence, and far-reaching influence, making them a formidable force that law enforcement agencies tirelessly combat. You see, the Tijuana Cartel's power lay in its strategic location. Based in Tijuana, they had a tight grip on the smuggling route stretching into California, the primary gateway to the United States. And it's not just about controlling the transportation, importation, and distribution of mind-boggling amounts of cocaine, marijuana, heroin, and methamphetamine. No. Their influence went even deeper. It reached the highest echelons of power and seeped into the very streets of American cities. They were everywhere. Led by the infamous Arellano brothers, the AFO operates as a family affair. They took over the organization from Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who was imprisoned for the murder of DEA special agent Enrique Camarena. Alberto Benjamin Arellano Felix brought a new era of calculated business tactics to the world of drug trafficking. But if there's one brother who stood out from the rest, it's Ramon Eduardo Arellano Felix. This guy was ruthless. And I mean ruthless. He oversaw protection details and held absolute control. They even got international mercenaries on their payroll, advisors, trainers, and full-fledged members. Ramon had a special job, planning the assassinations of rival drug leaders and even Mexican law enforcement officials who refused to cooperate. With a network of enforcers and hit teams, the AFO operated with precision. They recruited enforcers from violent street gangs in Mexico and the United States, eliminating targets and sending a chilling message to those who dare cross their trafficking domain. Complex communication centers in major Mexican cities served as hubs for electronic espionage and counter-surveillance, ensuring their operations remain hidden from law enforcement. Over the years, the Tijuana cartel has been caught up in a deadly rivalry with their counterparts from the Sinaloa cartel, like all others on this list. These clashes have left a trail of blood and destruction as both sides fight tooth and nail for control over the most profitable drug routes and territories. This bitter feud has shaped the history of Mexico's drug trade, and the violence still simmers to this very day. In 2016, it got rebranded as the Cartel Tijuana Nueva Generation, Spanish for New Generation Tijuana Cartel. They formed an alliance with the CJNG, or the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, and the Beltran Leva Organization to counter the Sinaloa Cartel. However, this alliance has weakened over time. Now, the Tijuana Cartel, CJNG, and Sinaloa Cartel are engaged in a fierce battle for trafficking dominance in Tijuana and Baja California. The struggle for control between these rival cartels continues to shape the drug underworld landscape. The Carboca Cartel Caborca is a town that goes way beyond being a mining hub and a hotspot for exporting asparagus and grapes. Situated near the Arizona border and the Gulf of California, it finds itself in the midst of a gripping turf war involving four criminal groups. What's even more intriguing is that two of these groups are under the control of the sons of the infamous drug lord El Chapo. It's like a family affair. The other half belongs to Rodrigo Paez Quintero, the nephew of the notorious drug lord Rafael Caro Quintero, the mastermind behind the Guadalajara cartel. Rodrigo is believed to be at the helm of the Caborca Cartel, an influential criminal organization that primarily focuses on drug trafficking operations in the border municipality of Caborca. Let's rewind a bit. Back in the day, his uncle Caro Quintero pulled off some audacious acts. He even managed to kidnap a DEA agent, a pilot, a writer, and a dentistry student. He tried to escape to Costa Rica, but his luck ran out. He was apprehended and sent back to Mexico, where he received a hefty 40-year prison sentence. With him locked away, the Guadalajara Cartel he was associated with fell apart. Some of the big shots ended up joining other cartels like Tijuana, Sinaloa, and Juarez. But after serving 28 years, Caro Quintero somehow got released in 2013 due to some legal mess-up. Of course, he wasted no time getting back into the drug trafficking game, which promptly made him a wanted man again. The United States didn't take kindly to his return and slapped an astonishing $20 million reward on his head, making him the FBI's most wanted fugitive. But justice eventually caught up with him. After exhausting his legal options, Caro Quintero was arrested in Mexico on July 15, 2022, and is currently awaiting extradition to the United States. However, the story doesn't end there. Quintero's group is presently embroiled in a violent conflict with the Los Salazar criminal cell, which serves as the armed faction of the Sinaloa cartel. This group has allied with the Juarez cartel to stake their claim on the territories of Sonora and Chihuahua as they regroup and strive to seize control previously held by El Chapo, a real-life crime thriller before our eyes. Unfortunately, the violence associated with this turf war has taken a toll on the municipality of Caborca. In 2019, the town witnessed 120 homicides, ranking it as the 24th most violent municipality in Mexico. The intensity escalated further in 2020, with at least six shootouts between rival groups, resulting in the loss of 12 lives. The situation worsened in July 2022 following Caro's arrest, with clashes leading to a shocking 28 deaths. Within just four days, the Juarez Cartel 
The Juarez Cartel, also known as the Vicente Carrillo Fuentes Organization, or VCFO, holds a long and turbulent history in Mexico. Also starting back in the 1980s, like another cartel we'll see later, it began under the leadership of Rafael Aguilar Guajardo, who had some tight connections with the Guadalajara Cartel. But when Aguilar Guajardo met his demise, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, also known as El Señor de los Cielos, or Lord of the Skies, took charge and turned the cartel into a major player in the drug trafficking game. Carrillo Fuentes had big dreams expanding their operations all over Mexico and even into Central and South America. But in 1997, Carrillo Fuentes met a sudden and mysterious end, leaving the cartel in a bit of a pickle. His brothers, Vicente and Rodolfo, stepped up to fill the void. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Power struggles erupted, causing internal chaos and more violence. And to make matters worse, Rodolfo went and killed two of El Chapo associates, sparking a full-on war between the Juarez cartel and the Sinaloa cartel. This rivalry between the Juarez cartel and the Sinaloa cartel turned Ciudad Juarez into an absolute war zone. They were fighting tooth and nail for control over drug routes and that strategic border town. It got so bad that the city recorded over 33,000 murder probes in 2018 alone. The Juarez cartel started splitting into smaller factions like La Linea and their control over territory weakened. That gave new rivals the Nuevo Cartel de Juarez and the Sinaloa cartel's Los Salazar faction a chance to swoop in and try to take over. The Juarez cartel maintains its influence by co-opting local local law enforcement, particularly the police and municipal forces. They've also buddied up with other criminal organizations like the Beltran Leyva Organization and the Zetas to give the Sinaloa cartel a run for its money. The cartel has its own enforcers called La Linea, and let me tell you, these guys are no joke. But even they've had their fair share of challenges and might have made some alliances with other groups like the Zetas to keep their power intact. The Juarez cartel isn't one to play nice. They're all about brutal tactics, think decapitations and displaying mutilated bodies in public to strike fear into the hearts of their rivals. They recruited local street gangs like the Aztecas and the La Linea, a bunch of ex-police force deserters, to enforce their control and transport drugs. The Juarez cartel is still a force to be reckoned with, even though it's fractured into splinter factions. Their influence stretches across different Mexican states and major cities, from Sinaloa all the way to Mexico City. The Gulf Cartel. Next on the list is the Gulf Cartel, also known as Cartel del Golfo. This is one of Mexico's oldest criminal organizations. It's been around since the 1930s, and it started as a small-time marijuana and heroin operation, but things quickly escalated. Back then, its young, ambitious drug lord named Juan Garcia Abrego took the reins and struck a deal with the Colombian Cali Cartel. They were looking for new ways to smuggle their goodies into the U.S. after the U.S. cracked down on their Caribbean roots. Smart move for a smart young Juan. So, Juan became the middleman handling cocaine shipments across the Mexican border. He took on all the risks, but also raked in up to 50% of the profits. With high risks come high stakes in any business venture, don't you agree? But, as they say, all that glitters isn't gold. Abrego found himself in a bit of a pickle when he was arrested and deported to the United States in 1996. You couldn't have imagined the chaos when billions of dollars in cash flowed in, and they had to figure out a way to smuggle it across the border back to Colombia through ingenious methods, from suitcases to underground tunnels. But the legacy of Garcia Abrego would endure as other kingpins stepped into the spotlight, demanding more control over distribution and fueling a wave of violence and corruption. Osiel Cardenas Guillen, Garcia Abrego's successor, would reshape the Gulf Cartel in ways that shocked even its Colombian partners. With a cunning blend of military strategy and ruthlessness, Cardenas formed a specialized enforcer wing known as the Zetas, recruiting former soldiers with an offer more than five times their previous pay and arming them with unmatched firepower. The Zetas became the cartel's bloodiest and most feared legacy, plunging Mexico's drug war into a new era of brutality. We'll see them later on. But here's where it gets interesting. Osiel got caught by the US authorities in 2003, and his former protection unit, known as the Zetas, decided to go rogue and form their cartel. Forget about the fact that they were trying to stand up against El Chapo and his Sinaloa. It was a family feud gone wrong. The Zetas became notorious for their brutal tactics and influenced Mexico's drug war like nobody else. Suddenly, water became thicker than blood. Since then, the Gulf Cartel has splintered into multiple factions, but there are still some fighting for control in the borderlands. In March, one of these factions supposedly kidnapped four Americans in Matamoros, resulting in two deaths and anger across the US. With the influx of fentanyl and this shocking incident, Mexico is under pressure to act against these cartels. The Los Zetas Cartel. 
Our story of the enigmatic Los Zetas begins in 1997 when Osiel Cardenas Guillén set his sights on the throne of the Gulf Cartel, a fearsome criminal organization controlling Mexico's drug trade from the depths of Tamaulipas State. Determined to seize power, Cardenas Guillén handpicked a group of 30 battle-hardened ex-Special Forces soldiers, led by the legendary Lieutenant Arturo Guzman de Sena. Now, Cardenas Guillén had a chilling order that would earn him the haunting nickname The Friend Killer, and it was none other than his trusted bodyguard, Arturo Guzman de Chena who carried out this order without a second thought. It was an order to execute the godfather to Cardenas's baby, Gomez Herrera, who was at the time of formation of Los Zetas, colleague, and at the same time, rival to Cardenas. This act of betrayal would lay the foundation for the alliance between Gillen and Guzman, ultimately giving birth to what we now know as Los Zetas. Originally functioning as an elite security detail, Los Zetas gradually transformed into a fully-fledged criminal organization over a span of 12 years, leaving a trail of bloodshed and chaos in their wake. In their early days, they pursued power and dominance with unwavering determination, eliminating rivals with military precision. These highly trained operatives, hand-picked from Mexico's elite military forces, unleashed a wave of violence that reverberated throughout the criminal underworld. Their ruthless tactics and psychological warfare struck fear deep into the hearts of their adversaries, demonstrating that sometimes the most potent weapon is sheer terror itself. Los Zetas proved to be an enigma, evolving from their origins into an independent force to be reckoned with, forever etching their name into the annals of criminal history. Los Zetas wanted more than just Mexico. They aimed to tap into the lucrative U.S. drug markets. Their strategic position along trafficking routes gave them an edge, extending their reach deep into American territory. Law enforcement faced a daunting challenge as Los Zetas established wholesale points and smuggling networks across the U.S. Their audacious attacks and sophisticated operations tested those tasked with bringing them to justice, but fate had other plans. In 2002, tragedy struck when De Sena fell in the line of duty, leaving a void. Heriberto Lascano, alias El Lasco, or Z3, stepped up to lead in the uncertain future. Meanwhile, their employer, Cardenas Guillén, was apprehended in 2003, thrusting Los Zetas deeper into the drug trade. During this tumultuous period, Los Zetas faced a defining moment. The Sinaloa cartel, a formidable rival, aimed to control Nuevo Laredo, a crucial hub for smuggling cocaine into the U.S. Los Zetas fiercely resisted the Sinaloa incursion, while also dealing with La Familia Michoacana, a protege turned enemy. Rival factions accused Los Zetas of tarnishing the drug trafficking industry, leading to a clash of titans. As the drug war raged on, Los Zetas expanded its repertoire beyond enforcement. They ventured into smuggling people, kidnapping, extortion, and arms trafficking. They even orchestrated the audacious theft of over $1 billion in oil from Mexico's national oil company, Pemex. Their reach extended beyond borders, infiltrating neighboring Guatemala and leveraging corrupt police as informants to bolster their operations. The Jalisco New Generation, CJNG. On the very last rival cartel, and probably the deadliest, there's the Jalisco New Generation, popularly known as CJNG. Now, before I jump into the details, let me give you a quick rundown. The Jalisco Cartel, according to people in the know in the US government, is like the Amazon Prime of synthetic drug distribution in North America. Yeah, they're quite the big players in the illegal amphetamine market, not just in the US, but even in Europe. And they might even have connections in Asia, too. The CJNG first came into existence as a splinter group of the Millennio Cartel, a key ally of the mighty Sinaloa Cartel. In 2009, the Millennio Cartel's leader was captured leading to internal divisions within the group. Sensing an opportunity, the CJNG broke away and started as an armed wing of the Sinaloa cartel. Together, they waged a ruthless turf war against Los Zetas in Veracruz state, leaving a trail of violence and bloodshed in their wake. You know, back in 2020, the Mexican government had its eyes on the CJNG. They labeled it the ultimate menace, the most treacherous criminal organization in all of Mexico. And guess what? It ranked right after the Sinaloa cartel as the second mightiest drug cartel in the land. Under the leadership of their enigmatic leader Ruben Oseguera Cervantes, also known as El Mencho. The CJNG evolved into a formidable criminal organization in its own right. He was a former police officer who is currently the most wanted person in Mexico and one of the most wanted in the US. Seems like he redefined the whole protect and serve concept, don't you think? Oh, and by the way, there's a $10 million reward just waiting for the brave soul who manages to nab him. Rising from the shadows, they transformed from a merely armed wing into a sophisticated drug producing and trafficking empire, supplying markets across the globe. They've made a name for themselves with some seriously jaw-dropping stunts. They're so extra that they've been known to hang their victims' bodies from bridges. Yeah, you heard that right. It's supposed to be what you'll only find in horror movies or something, but you'd be wrong. It was a signature way of sending a message, and a very gruesome one. I bet their rivals got the chills just thinking about it. They even took down an army helicopter with a rocket-propelled grenade way back in 2015. That wasn't some black magic action. Their activities expanded beyond drugs, encompassing extortion.
extortion, kidnapping, human trafficking, illegal mining, and even oil theft. They've also got a knack for targeting state officials too. Probably not big fans of bureaucracy, huh? To fuel its growth and international ambitions, the CJNG extended its reach to nearly every corner of Mexico, establishing a presence in 27 out of the country's 32 states. However, this expansion has not come without consequences. The CJNG's presence often triggers violent clashes with rival criminal groups vying for control of lucrative territories, leading to increased violence and instability at the local level. The CJNG, who used to be buddies with the Sinaloa cartel, are now mortal enemies. They've been having some seriously dangerous fights, mostly over who controls trafficking areas, especially in Guatemala. The CJNG wants to spread its influence, but that means more clashes and more violence. They're basically big shots in the crime world today, with their assets valued at a staggering $20 billion, especially since El Chapo got locked up. That's all on today's exploration of the dark world of El Chapo's deadliest rival crime cartels. Remember to click on the cards on your screen, and of course, stay on the right side of the law. Until next time.